Welcome to the recorded version of Understanding the Emotional Aspects of Caregiving, part of the Family Caregiver Support webinar series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. Our presenter today is Dr. Amy Dupree, a gerontological social worker who is an internationally renowned expert on lifestyle issues relating to caregiving, retirement, aging, and family dynamics. Dr. Dupree is president of Essential Conversations, Inc., and Dr. Amy, Inc., a company dedicated to family caregiver wellness. Dr. Dupree holds a Ph.D. and Master's in Social Work, specializing in gerontology, and earned her CSA, a designation for which she also trains others, as part of their accreditation. Dr. Dupree is a much sought-after speaker at corporate and professional events on the topics of caregiving, aging, and retirement, and she's also a frequent guest on radio and television. And with that, I'd like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Amy Dupree. Welcome, Amy. Thanks, Steve. I'm glad to be here today, and I want to welcome everybody onto the webinar. Uh, this is a, a great topic for all of us, whether we're professionals or family members on the call, because what we know is that this is a very challenging occupation, whether you're doing it for a family member or you're doing it professionally. And one of the issues that I think we have as professionals is finding very practical ways to support families as they deal with these emotional issues. It's obviously a very intense emotional experience for family members in a different way than it is for those of us as professionals. And I think recognizing those emotions, how do we help families through those emotions, and then how do we deal with the emotions that we also are experiencing as professionals are really key. So we're going to have an opportunity in the next hour to take a look at some, some of the emotional impacts uh, from a study that was done that I think is a really useful piece of research. And then we're going to take a look at strategies that can help caregivers cope. And you see on your screen some of the things that we're going to look at. And then we're going to take a look at resources that you can use and that you can refer caregivers to. So let's get started by taking a look at the emotional impacts of caregiving and what we know from the research. So first, I'd like to start by sharing our research that was undertaken by Home Instead Senior Care. They did this research last year, and they interviewed over 1,000 caregivers across North America to better understand how caregivers is, are coping. Now, I don't think it'll surprise any of us that interviews confirm that people who are caring for an aging parent or an older family member experience a whole range of emotions on their caregiving journey. The good news is that a lot of those emotions are, are emotions that feel good to people, and those are on the, the left-hand side of your screen, things like love, tenderness, gratitude, appreciation, satisfaction, satisfaction, a sense of accomplishment that they're doing something important. However, especially those who care for someone with dementia or who are spending a significant amount of time each week caregiving, they're experiencing a lot of the emotions you see on the right side of your screen, things such as frustration, anger, that sense of being overwhelmed. And the key here is that we know how people feel about their feelings can make a big difference. So, for example, if you believe it's okay to feel love and tenderness and those emotions are good, but that anger and frustration or resentment are bad and wrong, it really complicates the emotional package because then what people tend to add to that are the feelings of guilt. They feel like they shouldn't be angry with their parent or they shouldn't have this sense they can't manage it. And I think one of the things that as professionals we can really support people in is the idea that there are no good or bad emotions, that it, they're just emotions and that all of the emotions they're feeling are acceptable, that they're a normal part of the caregiving experience, and that as caregivers, they're likely to go back and forth among these different emotions, and the goal is to just find ways to not let the difficult emotions control the experience. Uh, often these emotions are pretty intense, and people are caught off guard by them. You know, in any life event that we go through, we tend to experience mixed emotions, but we don't talk about that a lot, whether it's a, a, an event that most people see as positive, like getting married or having a baby there are still aspects to that that trigger some difficult emotions. But in the mix, it tends to be more of the easy ones and less of the ones that are harder to manage. And in caregiving, that mix isn't so good. Often for people, the difficult emotions are pretty strong. So what we're going to talk about today are ways to deal with some of that. So let's take a look at what came out of the study around difficult emotions. 
So according to that research, many of the caregivers who feel those emotions that are harder to experience end up repressing those feelings. And the reason this is so important is that by repressing those feelings, there's a lot that happens there that, that complicates it. So just looking at the repression part of this, you can see there that 44% of caregivers caring for someone with Alzheimer's or other dementia are repressing their feelings. In addition, we have a large percentage of people who are providing care 20 or more hours a, a week who report they're feeling overwhelmed and that they're also repressing those feelings. And then you can see that only 44% of individuals that are providing fewer than five hours of care per week report feeling overwhelmed. Still a pretty high number, but not as high as that 64%. So the, the, the point of this slide is that when you start increasing the number of hours, you start increasing that feeling of overwhelm. And then we know that caregivers are also more likely to repress their feelings. So let's take a look at what are the impacts of repressing feelings, because I think this is the part that many of us uh, probably don't understand as well. So let's take a look at uh, what happens when caregivers have repressed feelings. One of the first things that we see is they experience more anxiety just by repressing their feelings. They talk about having difficulty watching their loved ones decline. They feel like they're not doing enough. They're feeling like they have to be present all of the time. They're feeling very alone and oftentimes they're feeling a great deal of stress on their relationships or marriage. And again, this issue of not just having the feelings but repressing them is the part that I think is the more interesting part of this research. So it's not just more anxiety. Let's take a look at the next slide and you'll see it's also more frustration. So we have caregivers who say, you know, when I repress my feelings, I'm much more likely to feel frustrated. And these are the things they specifically are feeling frustrated about. They, they can't manage the demands on their time. They are experiencing a, a sense of lack of control. They feel like they can't find answers that they need. They don't have the support system they need. So all significant things for us as professionals to be earmarking because we have an opportunity to impact on these things, both individually, these impacts, and also uh, more holistically. Okay, now let's take a look at guilt. So we've talked about anxiety, frustration. They also tell us they're more likely to feel guilt when they repress their feelings. So we have caregivers who are wishing they could do more. They're also feeling guilty because they're not as patient as they want to be. And then they're feeling guilty because they're not spending time with the rest of their family because they're caregiving for their aging parents. And then they're feeling guilty because they've had to move an aging parent out of their home or they just feel guilty about complaining about the demands of caregiving. Now, as professionals, I think we know that guilt is one of the most difficult emotions caregivers experience. And in my experience, it's also one of the most frequent emotions that people have guilt about all the things they're either not doing or all the things that they're feeling. So by repressing their feelings, if we see that they're actually experiencing guilt more and if they're not repressing their feelings, then we again have to look at how do we get them to deal with these feelings. Let's take a look at an interesting chart about the, the uh, sense of having less positive emotion. So caregivers who repress their emotions don't get to experience as much as the positive. Now we're going to look at two or three slides that have these charts. This is the one that actually has the least differential between caregivers who repress emotions and caregivers who don't repress emotions. But you can see on, that, on those categories that in every instance, the caregivers who are repressing their emotions aren't getting a much, as much of the good feelings that go along with caregiving. So they're not getting to experience all the positive things that we know people can have when they're caregivers. Let's take a look at the next one because the, the next one is more dramatic. So not only do they not get to experience as much of the positive, but they're actually experiencing significantly more of the negative emotions. So look at the differential between things like the overwhelm for caregivers who are repressing emotions versus other caregivers or the frustration. Pretty notable differences. And if you look at the next slide, which again takes a look at some other aspects of this, 
you can see these are pretty noticeable differences. So the ones who are repressing emotions are really the ones who are saying, I'm not feeling all that appreciated in what I'm doing. And I'm really finding that I'm pretty resentful about what I'm doing. And the one that I think is most concerning in this is look at the depressed and suicidal thoughts. So caregivers with repressed emotions are experiencing significantly more of uh, depressed and suicidal thoughts, as well as guilt and a sense of hopelessness. And, and to me, if we look at what the one thing is that we can offer caregivers is we can offer them a sense of hope. But we want that hope to come from a, a place that is genuine and realistic and not just a false sense of hope. So as we move through the rest of the webinar, I really want to talk to you about how do we instill hope in a genuine way to help caregivers have a better experience. Okay, let's take a look at another one of these slides to look at the health impacts of repressing emotion. So we know that the majority of caregivers experience fatigue. You can see that 60% of caregivers who aren't repressing emotions. But look at it, it goes up to 74% when we repress emotions. Individuals who repress their feelings are more likely than other caregivers to experience the negative health changes that happen to caregivers. So look at that, for example, caregivers who hide their emotions are almost two and a half times more likely to experience depression and two times more likely to have experienced high blood pressure since becoming a caregiver. And, you know, high blood pressure is one of the biggest health risks we know that people have as they age. It's one of the most common. And we know it's tied to things like cardiovascular issues, including stroke. And many people leave that untreated. So I think this is a, a, a huge topic to see that the repressed caregivers repressing emotions are having twice as much high blood pressure than caregivers who aren't repressing emotions. Okay, so now let's take a look at the next slide. What we want to move into now, having heard that, are the strategies to help caregivers cope. So what can we do as professionals to help caregivers manage those emotions, avoid jeopardizing their health, and just generally have a much more positive experience as caregivers? So look, let's look at some strategies. There are four things we want to talk about. We want to look at how do we help people acknowledge feelings? How do we help them release the difficult emotions? Find practical solutions to their caregiving issues? And then be able to engage in really enjoyable activities. We're going to talk about all four of these strategies, and I really believe that we need to help on all four of those. And this is a way that we can help caregivers assess where they are, too. We can look at what's the issue going on with the person we're dealing with, is it that they, they need to step back and be able to talk about their feelings and, and deal with those? Do they need to release those emotions? Are they just needing a practical solution to something? Or do we need to help them find more enjoyment in life again? So let's start with the acknowledgement piece of this. So in an average day or week, we know that caregivers can experience a wide range of emotion going from those that we talked about being easier to deal with, the love, the tenderness, and then moving into the anger and resentment, that those can shift from moment to moment, from hour to hour. One of the things we can help people do is to accept those feelings and avoid judging themselves so harshly for what they're feeling. It, the, the complication that I've heard over and over, and I'm sure many of you on the phone who are working directly with caregivers have heard, is that they feel like they're a bad person if they feel angry with their parent or if they feel frustrated or if they have the sense they kind of want to run away. We can help them become aware of the feelings they may be experiencing and acknowledge and normalize, and that really is the key word. I think normalizing these feelings is so important for people and then providing the reassurance. We can reinforce that as a caregiver, it's important to know that it's normal to feel all of those emotions often at the same time. One of the ways I help people do this is to think about their feelings uh, like a pie. So perhaps 30% of the pie at any given moment they may be feeling angry and 20% is guilt, but the rest of the pie may be love and tenderness. Seeing it as a pie can help them realize that you can experience very different emotions simultaneously. So you can have that back and forth so quickly and that it doesn't mean that they're, all they have is anger, that the anger 
is offset by the other emotions. Often when I work with caregivers, I know that they'll talk to me about the, the guilt and the resentment, and they'll say, but when I get that, I try to push that away. And I think what we can do is say to them, no, if you think about this like a pie, you're going to have slices of those pie, that, those, that pie that may not feel really good, but you have these other emotions too. So let's accept and acknowledge all of them and know that this is completely normal. And I think the more we can help them accept and experience all of those emotions and actually sit with them, the less those emotions will need to be repressed. And again, you saw how negative it is when people repress all those emotions. So this leads us to looking at how do you then release the emotions. So let's take a look at that. You can't release emotions you haven't acknowledged. That's why it's so important to start with the acknowledgement piece. Then the second strategy is for caregivers to release their feelings in a safe way. And many times people don't want to do the release phase because they're afraid that if they release their emotions, it will get out of control. So again, find, helping them find outlets that are very safe is important. This is very individual about how people want to do this. There are some folks who love to journal and are going to want to journal as a way to release feelings. Personally, that would be my least favorite technique that you see on the page. I'd be much more interested in the support group or talking to a, a friend or a therapist, some way that releases it verbally for me. So this is really getting your client to get into touch with what works for them. In addition, for many people, exercise, meditation, yoga, prayer are all very beneficial ways of releasing the stress and releasing the emotion. Obviously, if a caregiver hasn't been exercising regularly, you know, we need to encourage them to talk to their doctor about a safe way to get started. But when you look at exercise specifically, we know that there's a lot of research showing how much it enhances mood, relieves stress, builds strength, very, very positive benefits, helps people sleep better. So for caregivers especially, I think we need to really encourage them for good self-care to be exercising. We also know that many caregivers turn to prayer as a source of relief uh, and to meditation. There are lots of studies done that talk about the benefit of that. So if that is something that someone embraces, we certainly can encourage them to do that. As professionals on the right side of your screen, you can see what your role can be in this. Really encouraging caregivers to take the time to release the stress. And often caregivers will, will to some degree fight that because they say they don't have time to do these things. They don't have time to go to a support group or they don't have time to take, to go have coffee with a friend. And I think we have to go back to them understanding that concept that if they don't take care of themselves, they will not be able to be there for the person they're caring for. And, uh, you know, this, we know this more and more. And I, if you've been on webinars with me before, you know, I often use the analogy about plugging in your cell phone because, Many times people will say, I just don't have the time, and I'll say, you carry a cell phone. Would you expect your cell phone to continue to work if you didn't recharge the battery? And they immediately get that, and you can have a conversation about how important this is. I also think as professionals, we can really share with caregivers what we know from the literature about the, the negative consequences of not taking this time, because people don't take the time because they don't want to not be there for the person and they think they have to devote all their time to that. And I think we have to really let them know that if they don't take the time, they're not going to be able to go the long run. And again, I often use the analogy of the difference between running a marathon and a sprint and that we know in the beginning phases people muster all their resources to care for someone and that's an appropriate thing to do when there's a crisis, but you cannot use crisis behavior for the long term. People have to switch into a sustainable mode of caregiving, and we really need to help them do that. And part of that is this idea of having a safe place to release emotions. I just want to talk about one of the points on there, which is talking to a non-judgmental friend. Sometimes people can get the support they need from a family member, but oftentimes there's too much emotion attached to that relationship, and they're engaged in it too. So I encourage people to have one person at least outside of the caregiving situation who can be there just for them. And I know in my own caregiving experience with four siblings, there were times that we could support each other, and then there were times we had to turn outside of that because some of the stress was coming from us trying to relate to each other and figure out how to do the caregiving. So it's really key to, to encourage people to have somebody outside the family 
or outside the support system that they're using to care. Another thing I think as you look at your role in this, uh, making referrals is key. And what that means is making referrals for things such as the support groups to a therapist if necessary, helping people get connected with the exercise, meditation, yoga. The referral piece is key because people don't have the energy to go find this for themselves. So we have to help make that easy. I'm a huge believer in support groups because I think there's nothing better than having people sitting with other folks who are going through similar situations, especially in the cases of dementia, where they can talk through practical solutions and sit with people who, are, who can say, I feel that same thing too. I think there is great comfort in knowing that the emotions we're feeling are normal and that other people are feeling them too. And then the last bullet point under professional there, listen. I think this is often the hardest for those of us who are working in jobs where we are pressed constantly to have a higher caseload, to see more people in shorter periods of time. And yet I think this is what often is the greatest thing people need from us. I really believe one of the greatest human needs is to feel heard and understood, not agreed with, but understood. And we may be the only place that these caregivers have for that. So I think the more as professionals we can ground ourselves to be present and to truly listen, we will much more likely have an impact on what our clients need. Okay, so that's the second step. We're talking about acknowledgement. We're talking about release. Let's take a look at the third, which is finding solutions. So when we talk about finding solutions, what we're talking about is changing what can be changed, and then we have to manage what can't be changed. And the reason this is key is a lot of times, once people are able to identify their emotions and to have an opportunity to release them, we can step back and say, some of those difficult emotions don't even need to exist if you can find solutions to the problems that are causing them. So we need to be very practical in this and helping people get the help where help is needed. So you see under the caregiver column here, uh, it may be an issue where there are family members, whether it's siblings or extended family members, who are not holding up their, their part of the caregiving. And caregivers need to be able to talk about it, but they also need to be able to talk with those people to get the help they need. And one of the keys I think we know is that caregivers are not always good about asking anyone for help, but especially within the family. And I, I think learning how to do this well makes all the difference. One of the things I recommend to caregivers is that they become very concrete in the way they ask for help, whether it's from their family or whether it's from the community at large or whether it's, it's from, you know, friends. And the way I suggest they do this is to make a list of everything that they're doing that takes over 15 minutes. When, and it doesn't just have to be the caregiving tasks but it may be tasks like picking their kids up from school or it may be getting the groceries. A lot of times caregivers will push back and say, well, that only takes me a few minutes about something. And I always say, you have four tasks that take you 15 minutes and you have an hour's worth of work you just got off your plate. So we have to figure out how to help them recognize that it's all those little things they're doing that may be causing the stress. And they may say, I don't have any help for caregiving, but they very well, if they have kids, may have someone who'd be willing to pick the kids up at school so they don't have to go do that or to, to have the kids over at the house one afternoon a week so that they get a break. Or, you know, I always say everybody goes to the grocery store. People are often very happy to pick up a few items for somebody. So going to the very practical level about making that list and then on the other side, making a list of, uh, as a friend of mine likes to say, everybody you've ever been nice to who could potentially hop in and be a support. And I think we have to help people move beyond the usual suspects here. So it may be the close friends, but it also could be uh, perhaps a, a volunteer organization. I know that in many, many school districts now, there, are, are, there is a requirement for, for kids to do a volunteer uh, experience or a certain number of hours of volunteering before they graduate. And in that case, this may be an opportunity for someone to get some help from one of those students. I actually know people who have done that in school districts, and it's worked very well, where the kids come in and they are able to do a few things. It gets them exposed to a caregiving situation and better understanding of 
what's going on in our aging society, and it helps the person get the break they need and to get a task done. So we have to move again beyond those usual suspects. In the sibling issue, I think one of the greatest barriers people have to asking for help from their siblings is they have the belief that their siblings should already be doing this without being asked. And I've heard this story over and over where people will say, well, you know, they're their parents too. Why should I need to ask them? And, and in one instance where somebody said this to me, I assured her she was absolutely right about that. Then I said, you know, do you want to be right or happy about that? Because you can be right to your grave and you don't get the help you need. And the suggestion I always make is, what is one task you could ask your sibling to do in a very concrete way? So I think getting people to think in small bites, whether it's could you manage this one thing or could you come over and spend one afternoon doing this. And then the other thing is getting real with our family about what we're not managing well. Because the other thing I know is the primary caregiver in the family, often without realizing it, is kind of the keeper of the information. They know what's going on. They know how hard it is. But their siblings and other family members just see things running smoothly. And so they may not be able to recognize that there's an issue going on. Uh, again, looking at what your role is in this, helping caregivers understand their feelings and help them have a readiness to ask for help can be a big piece of this. And then doing this coaching piece about how to ask for help is key. If you just say, you know, you really need to talk to your family member about this, it's not going to be helpful. They're really going to need coaching about how to, how to access all of those people you see on the left side of your screen. And then, again, when you talk about professional caregiving support, we as professionals really need to look at how we make good referrals for people and get them connected into the community so that they do not need to call 20 other professionals and be bounced around because all of us know how frustrating that is and how frequently that happens for, for caregivers where, when they're in the service system. Okay, let's take a look at the fourth aspect of this, which is engaging in enjoyable activities. So this is kind of the, the uh, in some ways, the, the best part of this, because if we can get people getting help they need, if we can get them acknowledging their feelings, then we're in a position to really help them start to enjoy life again. And just like asking for help, what I've found is people start to lose their ability to remember how to have fun in their life when they're caregiving. So let's talk about a very practical way that they can do this. One of the things they can do is to spend just a brief period of time listing out things that they either enjoy doing now or they used to enjoy doing. And for many folks, this is a difficult exercise. I, I'm actually in a, a, a business coaching group with some folks who, when they did this exercise, said they'd been busy for so long, they couldn't remember the little things they used to do that they enjoyed. So you may really have to help prompt this when you're working with caregivers. So whether it's something as simple as uh, reading a good book or going for a walk, reconnecting with nature, uh, whether it's being part of some craft group for someone or uh, working out with someone as a, you know, in, in, a, in some class and they want to go to a class with someone, whatever it is, they need to make a list that really is, is varied, things that they can do when they're home, things that they can do when they have an hour to get away, and encourage them to make the list as long as possible. Then what I suggest to people they start doing is to start scheduling mini breaks because for many caregivers, it is much too hard for them to think about taking off several hours at a time. It's hard, too hard for them to think about taking the day off. But if you talk to them about the fact that they could take 15 minutes a few times a day, that's usually something they can start building into their schedule. So starting with some of the things on the list that they could do, you know, you can turn on music and hear music for 15 minutes. You can, if you're, if you're recording TV shows, you can watch half of a 15, of a 30 minute TV show in 15 minutes. Actually, you can watch more because you're not watching the commercials. You could read for 15 minutes. The, the exercise, and I, I just heard somebody say about exercise, they said that people will often say to them, you know, exercising for 15 minutes doesn't make a difference. And they said, yeah, go ahead and, and, go ahead and try to do a crunches for 15 minutes or go ahead and try to do push-ups for 15 minutes and tell me it doesn't matter or, or jump rope for 15 minutes. So even little exercise breaks can make a huge difference. 
helping people plan in the mini breaks is the starting point, not the ending point. You know, I've had the opportunity to do home instead senior care cruises the last couple of years that were caregiver cruises. And one of the things we know is getting people away for a week is very hard because of the guilt and because of the fear that only they can do the job of being a caregiver for the person they love. So we have to help with that, but we have to back up by starting with the mini breaks. And then after you get the client to start building in these mini breaks, then you can start helping them build in whether it's an hour to go out to coffee with someone or it's an afternoon to go to a movie, whatever, or out to dinner with a friend, but being able to build that in. And again, this goes hand in hand with the last solution about finding help for people because if we don't help the caregivers find a backup person, then they're never going to be able to get out of the house. And I also want to stress how critically important this is when we talk about caregivers of folks with dementia, because we know that even more than other caregivers, they've got to have breaks or they simply cannot sustain the caregiving experience. So once you get them up to taking mini breaks and then taking perhaps an hour or an afternoon off a week, whatever that might be, then we can start talking to them about a longer break, about having respite. And that may be a few days, it might be a week. And we know the issues that people have when they go away. I know when my father was the primary caregiver for my mom, his big issue always was his fear when she was away. And I often was the one who went in and stayed with my mother. And for my dad, it was just that he was so committed to that role, it was hard for him to think about anybody else being there with my mother. But we would encourage him to go every year, and he would come back much more relaxed, more able to take on the job. And I know one of the the great stories from the caregiver cruise was a, a, a woman whose husband uh, was caring for her and he went on the cruise and when he came back she wrote a letter to thank uh, the, the folks who had sponsored her, him on the cruise and said, I sent away a crabby old man and I got my husband back at the end of the week. And I think it's a, it's a testament to how important it is to have that time away. Now, besides reinforcing the need for this and helping people figure that out, Again, we're really going to have to help people uh, understand that this is not selfish behavior by doing this, that they are actually going to be better caregivers. And if you have trouble getting people to buy into that, it might be worth your time making sure that you share with people just some of the facts, and you can pull them off of any caregiving site. You can pull them off of uh, caregiverstress.com that talk about the benefits of getting away from this caregiving experience and getting a break so that they can do a better job. Because if they don't do it for themselves, they're likely to do it for the person they're caring for. And then as professionals, we can also give the positive reinforcement about why this is so important and to, to do a check-in. A lot of times people are more apt to do this one if they also have some accountability, if you will. So it doesn't have to be from you as the professional, but setting up a buddy where they both say, okay, I'm going to check in with you next week and make sure you took some time off and actually making sure that happens. Accountability is such a funny thing, and I think we discount the importance of it. But we know that when people have accountability, even to someone who doesn't have any power over them, it actually helps them do better. And I, I think, you know, we have countless examples of that, of when people are uh, held accountable by even a friend that they're more apt to engage in the activity. And, and I often tell the story when I do a workshop about a time when I was trying to get my basement cleaned up because it was a, a disaster after I'd moved. And uh, ultimately I ended up having a friend come in and help me for a half day. And then I made myself accountable to her. And I used to laugh because sometimes I wouldn't have done what I said I was going to do that week. And so before the call, I'd race down and get done what I said I was going to do before I called her. And again, she had no power over me. It's just I didn't want to have to make that call and say, ooh, I didn't get it done. Okay, so now let's switch gears. Those are the four things. So, you know, just remember that we're talking about acknowledging, releasing, support, and engagement. And now let's take a look at uh, the emotions of those with no help. And take a look at that. So uh, uh, if you take a look at this slide, you see... This is, again, from the Home Instead research. There are many reasons why caregivers don't get help. 
one of them is that they feel that they owe it to their parents to care for them. And along with that is the idea that I have to do it alone. And I think we really have to help people overcome this idea that they have to go it alone. I always say to people, the goal isn't that you do all the care. It's that you make sure the person gets the best care. And usually the best care comes with a team of people to help. So, again, those people with repressed emotions have this belief that they have owe this to their parents and only they can do it. So you can see there's a bit of a difference between that and the other caregivers. And then it gives, it gives me, should be, should be me, satisfaction to help them. That's a very good one. Uh, but notice the difference here. For caregivers with repressed emotions, that's not as high as it is for other caregivers. So they're not getting that satisfaction, which, again, is the key point here, that we want people to be able to experience that satisfaction. The idea that I, can, I feel I can give them better care and again, you can see that's higher for the caregivers with repressed emotion. I always say to people, you likely are giving better care. However, what you need to look at is what's an acceptable level of care? Because we're not talking about perfect care. What we're talking about is making sure someone has good, very, very good care. So you start with safety first, and then you start with making sure basic needs are met, and then you look at quality of life issues. And it's true, no one else is going to do it exactly like you, but it doesn't mean that it's not good enough, and it doesn't mean then that you can't have some time off for yourself because that's a trap when you feel like only you can provide the best care. We sometimes have an issue that the parent refuses to accept outside help, and I'm sure there's many of you on the call that have dealt with this issue that someone says, I only want you. And I think this is where we as professionals can have a very interesting role. Because what we can do is we can potentially talk to the person who needs the help and talk about why it's so important not just to have help from their, their adult child or, or could be their spouse, why in order for everybody to maintain their, their lives and their satisfaction and their health that there may need to be other people in. Sometimes, uh, as a professional, we have a better chance of convincing someone that this isn't a fair situation to put that burden on their adult child, for example, that they do need to bring in other help. And I think we can talk about why it's so important for everyone, how it would work, and a lot of times it's just fear about having someone from outside the family into the house and what's that going to mean. So it's addressing what the fear is. And I have often sat with people and said, can you tell me, why you think your spouse or your child um, should be the only one doing this. Can you tell me what you're feeling or what you're afraid of? Because a lot of times they haven't had a chance to say, well, I'm afraid if I'm alone with someone who's not my family member, I won't be safe, or I'm afraid that the person's going to steal, or I think that because I cared for my child that my child should care for me and that I shouldn't have to turn to someone else. So you have to get at what the root issue is, and people often don't share that unless we ask. And then you see the last one is, I don't trust outsiders. And so really helping to overcome that means getting very practical, talking about uh, ways to have them feel safe, talking about how people are trained, talking about where they could call if they ever had a concern. So making sure, again, that there is uh, a, a sense of safety and comfort built in so that then they're not just going to rely on the person. And I think, again, it's encouraging people to see that the family and professionals are a care team. So the care team can be quite large. And, you know, you, you may have heard me say this before, but I, I say this a lot to people that uh, when you talk about caring for an aging parent, it is no different from that proverb about it takes a village to raise a child. It really takes a village to care for an aging relative. And actually it takes a village just to get through life. And so the more we can help people move within the village concept versus that they as the individual have to do it all, the healthier that we'll find out that caregivers can be. Okay, now let's take a look at some resources that you can look at and refer your clients to. So caregiverstress.com is a fabulous resource with a lot of uh, help on there. 
people can search based on topic, and there there are just I, I can't even tell you how how many resources there are in that site that is so helpful. Similarly, caremanager.org, fabulous site. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association is always a site I send people to if they're dealing with dementia issues. And then I always talk to people about making sure that they go to whatever the disease-related site is so that um, they, they can get specific information that's helpful about the disease or the disability because every, you know, whether you're talking about Parkinson's or stroke or diabetes, there is an association with a fabulous website that has fabulous resources, and we need to make sure we're connecting our clients to that and connecting them to support groups often that are based on those diseases. And that is incredibly helpful to people. I was talking to um, a client recently this week. This is a, a woman I'm working with whose husband has had a, a stroke, and he's been recovering for about a year and a half, but he's uh, he's been sort of at stable at this one level for a while. And she's, for the first time in the year and a half, really kind of hit the wall and the care that he needs and what needs to happen. And immediately she realized she needed to talk to other people in that situation when she started to get depressed. And so I was able to connect her to a stroke support group. And she said sitting and hearing those people's stories has given her the hope to go on. And I think it comes back to hope all of this, as I said in the beginning. And let's take a look at the next step, and I'll talk more about hope here. So when we talk about what you can do to help family caregivers, when we talk about this idea of acknowledging feelings, releasing emotions, helping them get the help they need, helping them engage in enjoyable activities again, overarching all of that is this idea of hope. And how do we instill in caregivers that they can keep going the distance and that the work they're doing is meaningful? And I think if every encounter we have with a caregiver, we ask ourselves, what's the hope I'm bringing to this family? And what's the realistic hope that I can offer them about how to manage their situation better so that they can have better quality of life? Then I think as professionals, we're doing the very best job that we can do for families. I also would encourage you when you think about your next steps after today to think about how you see yourself sharing and reinforcing those coping strategies and helping people at whichever of those four they might need immediately and recognizing that they're eventually going to need all four. And then again, of course, we'll talk about thinking about the resources that you can refer caregivers to in your area, making sure you have those at your fingertips and can help caregivers access them quickly without getting lost in the care system, because that's really key. Okay, I'm going to pause here, and I'm going to turn it back to Steve, who's going to open up the lines for questions. Steve? All right. Thanks a lot, Amy. Mm -hmm. And as Amy just mentioned, it is time for the Q&A portion of the web seminar, so text us in those questions, and we will pose them to Dr. Amy. Um, Amy, earlier, um, uh, pretty much towards the beginning of the session today, you were talking about the caregiver study uh, that was done. Can you just uh, talk a little bit more about uh, how many people were in that study and how they were, and how the caregivers were defined? Um, there were over a thousand people in that study, and I, I don't at this moment. I've read this study several times, but I don't have the study uh, right in front of me at this moment. But we can certainly send that out, that information out to anyone who would want it, who would talk about how much time the caregivers were spending caring, how they were found all that information. So if someone's interested in the uh, specifics of the study, we certainly can get that information with no problem. Okay. Um, you were also talking about the caregiver cruise. Is this an actual organized trip, or are you referring to it in a general way for caregivers to recharge? Uh, no, actually, it's an organized trip that Home Instead does every year for caregivers, and I, I've, I have done this trip now. This is I've done it three times, and I, I love doing the caregiver cruise because it's um, an opportunity for, obviously, caregivers to get a break. But we also do a, a couple of uh, – I do a couple of educational sessions typically, but fun. I mean, they're not – you know, they're, they're there to get away. And then we do uh, some support group. I do individual sessions for caregivers who want them. And, and usually outside, you know, this is a middle of the winter cruise. Uh, this, this year it was a, a five-day cruise that we did. There's one going to 
that's going to happen next year as well. So if people are interested, they can get information on it. And what's great is the caregivers are just nurtured the entire week. And then they're having dinner with each other. We sit at tables together and so people have a chance to chat with each other and laugh. And some people don't want to talk about their caregiving at all. And other people really want to talk about it and really want some support and help. And I have seen people transform during those few days because they get a break. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a caregiver cruise. That's just I, I mention that simply because I've had the opportunity to be involved with that. You know, whatever gets caregivers away, but this idea of offering caregivers a break, I think, is so important. And I love the nurturing and the support that happens on it. And then people just say it was an amazing week. Okay, uh, next question. My client is 100, and her daughter is her main caregiver. She's worried about leaving her overnight or much less for a week. How can I help her to overcome that fear? Well, I think the first step is to make sure there is appropriate care, right? So uh, I, I don't know what the situation is there, but you want to make sure the person's obviously going to be safe and well cared for. Another issue people often have when they're going to leave someone, whether it's for a week or a night, is the fear the person might die when they're not there. And so I will say to caregivers, you know, at some point we all know that not just the person we're caring for, but we ourselves are not going to be here. You know, it's a, uh, there, there is no getting out of this life alive. And so you don't know when the timing of that's going to be. So what you want to make sure is that if there are things you need to say or anything that's, that's not completed for you with that person, you do it before you go away. So if the timing happens to be when you're not there, that you're not feeling like, oh, you know, I never said that or I never had that conversation. Staying there is not the solution because people can live for years and years and years and you need to get away. And so, you know, uh, I think as long as the care is excellent, that can relieve that issue. And then I talk to people about that you need to recharge and why this is so important. And if the person you love is getting the care that they need, you need to be able to go away and turn it off for a period of time. Again, none of us can do any job or any role continually without a break. We need to have a break. And you have to talk about, you know, there's a reason we have vacations. There's a reason we have these things. And caregiving can be seen just like that, like a business or a career where you need to have the breaks. Otherwise, you're not efficient anymore. Okay, uh, Amy, this next one is a tough question. The uh, question is, I encounter adult caregivers with sibling rival rivalry that stems from prior years. Are there any books or any other resources you can recommend in coping with the siblings while trying to provide care for the aging parents? You know, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't know a book about this. Um, I, I know you can actually Google this topic online, and there are things. Home Instead Senior Care has a wonderful resource on this that I want to recommend to you. It's called the 50-50 rule, I think is what it's called, and it's about how to deal with your siblings. And you can find that on caregiver stress, and you can find it on homeinstead.com, uh, home uh, 50-50 rule, which talks about how do you actually work with your siblings in a harmonious manner. But I will tell you that for most people, this is the biggest challenge, is dealing with their family, and it often is the past issues. You know, I, I think when we hit, uh, whether it's, our 40s, 50s, 60s might happen earlier. There is a, a, a revisit that happens to people about the relationship they had with their siblings when they were young. And it's often this, I always knew mom loved you best, or people fall into their roles, and we can see it happen. And I often recommend to people, too, that they think about the fact that they, need, they may need an outside facilitator to help with those family meetings, because it's difficult sometimes to work with our family members without somebody else being part of the process. So I would encourage people to think about, do they need to have a third party who's neutral, helping the family figure out the best care plans, where things are going, and who's going to do what. And, and Steve, I just want to share about this. You know, when I, when I, did, when I was a caregiver to my parents, I, I really had to work on this because I found that part of caregiving often very stressful. And it took me a long time to be able to figure out how to keep things harmonious while making sure my parents have the best care. And it's not an easy road to walk. 
you know, that, that's a challenge. And I know Mary Alexander, who is often on the calls with me, she wasn't able to join me today. She did a fabulous job of working with her family when her mom was dying and her mom was ill for quite a while. And it was out of that experience that that 50-50 guide got developed. So it's free. Feel free to download it and also to Google the topic. Okay. Uh, next question. Some of the research I've read says that uh, employing the strategies that we've been talking about here today earlier in the caregiving journey is beneficial. Yet I see a lot of caregivers who don't seem to be able to use these strategies until they are already in a crisis. What advice do you have for helping caregivers to adopt these strategies before they actually feel like they're in trouble? That's a great question. I love that question because I think it gives us as professionals uh, a point to uh, – to intervene, and I think this idea of helping people move this down the caregiving cycle when it's a newer caregiving experience versus when they're already burned out is a great idea. So I think what you can talk about when you talk to caregivers is your experience in working with families and how what happens over the life course of caregiving. And I think talking to people about caregiving as a journey and that what happens. And so, you know, one analogy sometimes I use with people is I'll talk to them about, would you go for a 30-minute a, uh, walk, uh, perhaps, and not bring water? And they say, yeah, I don't need to have water with me. Would you go hiking for three days and not bring water? And they say, well, no, of course I wouldn't do something like that. Right. And what if you were going to do a three-day walk and you decided not to think about the water until you were into day two? You're already too late, right? You're already dehydrated. So what we want to make you sure you do is like that we want you to be hydrated in your caregiving which means right from the start you have to put these things in place it's like carrying that water with you you have to prevent it it's too late once you're already dehydrated you start to have the negative effects of dehydration and then it's much harder to get yourself back on track you can do it but it's much harder and so again i think this idea of getting people to think about this in a different way and recognizing that one of the challenges of caregiving is that it is a constantly changing situation. So although you may be managing it well today, what you can almost guarantee is that this situation will shift and change. Doesn't mean it's going to become awful. It's just it's not going to look like what it looks today. And getting people to realize that by putting in these, these if you will, almost prevention techniques, that if it shifts and becomes much harder, they'll be prepared. You know, we don't wait for our houses to fall down around us before we do maintenance work. You maintain it. You put oil in a car before the car runs out of oil. And so, or you, you know, you're actually, you're going to seize the engine. So any of these analogies that get them to, to realize that prevention in so many areas of our life is the way we go, that they may say, I don't need to think about this yet. Well, you wouldn't say, I'm going to wait for my car engine to seize before I put oil in it. Okay, so I think whatever it is, whether it's the water bottle, the car, oil, finding ways to help them recognize that prevention is going to let them go the distance and is going to keep them being the caregiver they want to be. Okay, uh, what's your advice for caregivers who tell you that they have no funds to hire help and no family to share in the caregiving responsibility? I'm a, I'm a hospice social worker. Yeah, oh boy, yeah. Uh, not an uncommon common story. Uh, Again, what I would start with, because sometimes people have a hard time breaking tasks down, so what they don't do is think to themselves, okay, I'm going to think about in terms of 15-minute tasks. They're thinking big picture. I need somebody to come in and spend, you know, eight hours sitting with the person. So I try to get people into the, the chunk it out better, because sometimes when you chunk it out, you're actually able to see uh, that there are other people in your life who could do this, whether it's a friend or a neighbor. You know, again, when it comes to the grocery shopping, your neighbors all grocery shop. And you could say, you know, I'm going through this rough time. I'm wondering if you'd be okay picking up six items for me. You know, I, uh, who wouldn't pick up six items for someone? And, but that could save a trip to the grocery store. So helping people be creative, and I think this is the number one word in this, is creativity. We really have to encourage caregivers to get out of uh, their, their rut, if you will, that there is nobody, and to start thinking more creatively. So uh, that's one way. Another thing I do is to help them, I, I help them to start thinking beyond their typical family members, because sometimes there's a niece or a nephew or a grandchild or somebody who's willing to have some role in the caregiving. And it may be 
just calling up and having chats. So, you know, uh, that may sound like, oh, is that really that helpful? But it is helpful if it relieves you from having to be there all the time and the person could have a weekly conversation that gives them that much more social interaction. And then, again, taking that creativity theme, you start looking at, you start kind of moving out from the center outward. So is there a faith community that they're involved with or have been involved with? And do they have voluntary organizations within that faith community? Are there voluntary organizations within the greater community who might be interested? Uh, the woman I mentioned who hired, had the students coming in who were helping out as uh, volunteers also really did a great job utilizing community volunteers that were available through uh, an organization in her town, and she didn't even know that they existed until she just started picking up the phone and calling some of the town or city offices and saying, here's my issue. Do you know if there's any volunteer groups that might be able to help me out? So I think moving to that level is key. Now, obviously, if somebody has no money, we also want to make sure that they're assessed, you know, if they could potentially be Medicaid qualified, you want to make sure that they get assessed for that. Uh, are there any giveaways that you want to check out in your community for these sort of services that are specific to your community? All that's really key, too. Okay, uh, here's another tough question. What do you recommend when the care receiver has dementia and doesn't believe she needs any help and just wants to be left alone? Yeah, well, of course, the number one word I have for that is safety, safety, safety. And so um, that, that is a very difficult situation. And I think we need to recognize how important it is that we don't let somebody who is going to be unsafe be living alone. So we can't let that happen. So what we have to look at is, okay, so what could we do? And I think uh, what you can do is be creative here. Now, uh, I'm not a, uh, an advocate of lying to people, but there are times that we have to dance around things. So it may be you know, oftentimes when, when I was uh, overseeing an adult day program uh, situation, the, they would, there were people sitting in that day program who thought they were there as volunteers who were actually there, you know, because they needed to be in the day program. So, again, you have to be pretty creative here. Is there a way to get the help in that the person would accept? Um, and, again, a lot of times people will do things for us that they won't do for someone else. So uh, if the person says, I don't need any help, I'm fine, arguing is not going to help. So you're going to have to find a different way around that. A couple resources I want to turn your attention to. David Troxell's book is one of my favorites. Virginia Bell and David Troxell wrote a book which is called A Dignified Life, and they deal with some of the very specific issues around dementia caregiving and how to manage those. Uh, you know, distraction for people often works well, moving them to a different activity, telling them that they're volunteering because this person needs some support can be helpful. You know, if you bring somebody in, uh, having them engage in activities that they enjoy, all of those things can be helpful. But it's, it does, it's not going to work. The same thing is not going to work every time, and you're going to need to be creative. Okay, uh, one last really quick comment here, a Amy, you're just talking about dancing around a couple things. I thought this was a great comment to end on. Uh, we have uh, Tendi who wrote in and said, it's not lying, we call it therapeutic fibbing. Yes, it is, and I just actually did an article for that that's going to be in the uh, Huffington Post soon about therapeutic fibbing and when is it okay and how do you do it. So uh, keep your eyes open for that. I don't know when that's going in, but it's soon. All right, great. Well, Amy, we're just about out of time for today's web seminar, but I want to thank you for another excellent presentation. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it.